Of course, Muslims are now beginning to argue that the text of the Quran also developed over time. These are two Muslim scholars from Turkey who compared the supposed Uthmanic Quran in Turkey and some other Uthmanic Qurans to today's Quran. And their conclusion is those Qurans are very different in some of their details from today's Quran. And they say that that's not from Uthman's time. These are Muslim scholars. So Muslims are continuing to talk about the development of the text of the Quran. And it's not just now. It was originally as well. We saw that even in Muhammad's, uh, the Salaf generation, among the companions, people like Abdullah ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Ka'ab disagreed on the canon of the Quran. These are the people that Muhammad handpicked to teach the Quran to others. One of them would say that the Quran should have 116 chapters. The other would say that the Quran should have 111 chapters. These disputes were resolved in space and time. And that is why some people begin to argue, as Muslim scholars are still arguing today, that the Quran is created. So when Ibn Masud and Ubaid differed about how many chapters there were in the Quran, that's because human beings are doing the best they can to collect what they understand to be the word of God and to recollect the teachings that were left by the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. They were doing the best they can. These are the reports that came down to us. But the overwhelming majority of reports that came down to, to us from the early generation of Muslims convinces Muslims that the 114 chapters of the Quran that we have today is uh, completely the Word of God and only this is the uh, Quranic text. So when scholars like Atikulas and Islam Oglu are looking at the Quran and looking at early manuscripts, we're seeing all of this as part of the natural history that could occur within any book, but Muslims rest assured with the promise of the Quran, inna nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna we certainly, God has uh, revealed the Quran, and uh, God is preserving this Quran, the 15th uh, chapter, the ninth uh, verse. Dr. Ali, how do you answer Nabil's claim that there are multiple versions of the Quran? Uh, the Quran is a complex document. We believe that it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace in such a way that it could be recited in a variety of, of methods. And uh, all of this is the word of God. Now, to explain this uh, in a short answer would not be easy uh, because we, we need to first understand that Arabic, like Hebrew, is written without vowels. And uh, the Torah has had many different readings because of this. The Masoret brothers in the 10th century put in the vowels that we know today. And so the Bible is translated according to the reading uh, prepared by the Masoret brothers. Well, the readings of the Quran uh, were fixed uh, by, by Muslim scholars according to what they understood uh, from the earliest generations of Muslims. And this was done way back in the early a history of Islam. So seven readings became popular out of that whole effort to uh, put the vowels in the right places and pronounce the words of the Quran as they were pronounced by teachers who were the, and, and by previous teachers and so on. So for Muslims, all of these various readings are uh, the, the word of God. And sometimes these uh, various readings expand the meaning. It's voweled one way, or sometimes there's a variation in the wording, uh, but they have the similar meaning. Uh, two words, for example, ihan and suf, both mean wool. So one reading has ihan, another reading have, has suf that goes back to an early companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Muslims generally recognize that all of this is the word of God. In essence, the message is the same in all of these uh, readings. And the variety of readings do not give rise in Muslim thought to, okay, this one supports that somebody is a god, and this one does not support the same idea. Uh, the, the readings do have variations, uh, but it's not that kind of significant variation. And this is uh, acknowledged by academic scholars so who are not Muslims. If you don't mind, I'm going to call an audible here, and I'm going to allow uh, Dr. Qureshi to respond to that, but then I'll also allow you to respond to his, re to his question, his response to the question I posed him. <laughs> We're not going to go that far, but, I, but I'm going to let it go back, because I think we'll have enough time for that, but we'll do it equally. So, Dr. Qureshi. Please read Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 6, Book 61. Read the book on the collection of the Quran. It talks about different Muslims, such as Ubay ibn Qab. In book 61, Sahih Bukhari says that there are four teachers of the Quran. Abdullah ibn Masud is first, Ubay ibn Qab is fourth. It says that Ubay ibn Qab has words in his Quran that are not present in today's Quran, talking specifically about chapter 33. It's not a synonym, it's missing. Uh, we, uh, Abdullah ibn Masud in, um, uh, in uh, Kitab al-Masahif, in Ibn Nadim's Fihrist, he has different chapters than uh, Ubay ibn Qab. Um, there is no manuscript 
before 1924, exactly like today's Quran. The two Turkish scholars whose names I put up there, they have said that people have not studied the Uthmanic Qurans, they themselves did so and found many differences. Two Muslim Turkish scholars found many differences from the earliest Qurans to today's Qurans. These aren't just differences in vowels, they aren't just differences in readings, they're differences in even canon in the Rasm text. So I agree with you that generally speaking, substantially, the message isn't really changed. But if you're going to say that the Quran is word for word exactly the same, not a jot, a letter, tittle, iota has been changed, as I had been taught as a Muslim, that is demonstrably false. And the Quran, because of Uthman's burning of all the earliest Qurans, uh, does, we, we will never know what it originally said. We can only know what Uthman's Quran said, at best, even theoretically, whereas no one was ever in the position or ever did do it for the Bible. It's never been controlled, it's never been changed or altered in a, in a controlled sense like Uthman's Quran was. All right, we'll have to postpone the actual debate on the Quran, though, mm -hmm. till uh, the sequel. Did, did you to want this me one. to say something about that, too? <laughs> no, I tell you what, I'm going to ask him a question now, but I will give you a chance to respond to his question sure. as well. Uh, but I think uh, uh, Dr. Qureshi has actually touched upon a very important point here in speaking about uh, the eternal Son of God uh, dying on the cross, because it would mean that the second person of the Holy Trinity is expendable, and we can have the other two surviving and continuing to run the universe. And, and this actually ties into the previous uh, question about uh, different versions of the Quran, because actually we have four different Gospels, and we do not have comparably four different Qurans at the same uh, level of operation. And when we look at the words of Jesus, uh, his dying words on the cross, the four different Gospels have different wording. Michael Goulder in his book, St. Paul versus St. Peter, has shown uh, that this is part of the two streams of thought that went out from early Christianity. In Mark, the death of Jesus appears very bleak. In Matthew, appears better. In Luke, better still. In Luke, a father into your hands I commit my spirit. So it looks like Jesus is actively engaged in doing something with his own spirit here. And in the Gospel according to John, it is finished. That's what Jesus says last, as if Jesus is in full control, he completed his mission, he finished the whole thing, and now he's gracefully leaving. Not the loud cry, it's not there in John. Why? The story about Jesus has been changed from one gospel to another. Jesus' image has been photoshopped. In Mark's gospel, he appears very weak, and his death appears very bleak. In John's gospel, he is triumphant, and his death appears to be a victory.